Happy Sabbath! How are you all? I hope you all had a lovely, lovely week. And tonight I ask our Lord to continue to bless each one of us with His love, peace, and joy. Now we are proceeding forward to Genesis chapter 19. This is a very interesting chapter because I frequently have questioned about some of the things that is described here. So hopefully tonight we get a better understanding of it. Let me start reading from verse 1. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, My lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go on your way. They said, No, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered his house and he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Do you remember the last chapter? We talk about Abraham had three visitors, and then they discovered that two of them were angel, and one was the Lord. And so besides promising him a son the next year, he also revealed about the coming destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Then Abraham started pleading with the Lord. If there were 50, would you still destroy the cities? When there's 45, when there's 30, and it went all the way down to 10. Apparently, there weren't even 10 righteous people living in those cities. And so in response to Abraham's pleading or praying for the righteous, the two angels came to the city of Sodom to rescue Lot. Sodom was a beautiful city, which was in the plain that described as the garden of the Lord. Here, vegetation flourished, palm trees, olive trees, vines, and flower galore rich harvest every year and flocks and herds cover the hills art and comers enrich the city they lack nothing seemingly so the angels met lot at the gate do you know that in the ancient near east the gate of the city is an important place at the gate formal activities took place like public decisions were made there Cases were heard, even businesses were transacted there. And you can see visitors being processed or registered according to the protocol of the city. And Lot's presence in the gate was undoubtedly related to some of these activities. And I'm quite sure that Lot was not alone at the city gate, but surprisingly, he was the only one who interacted with the angel messengers and invited them to his home. Lot, just like Abraham, practiced hospitality according to the culture of the time. He washed their feet, baked them bread, and made them a feast. Let's read on. Verse 4. But before they lay down, the man of the city... The man of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us, that we may know them. Lot went out to the man at the entrance, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. 
only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand back. And they said, this fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. May know them, this phrase. Most scholars interpreted this phrase as to have sex with them. The context suggests that the man of Sodom intended to a homosexual relationship with the two visitors, and that's where the term sodomy came from. But then, lately, I also discovered that there were some advanced Hebrew alternate interpretation. And this word, no, they interpreted as interrogate. So they wanted to interrogate the men, the angels. Why? Because they distrust Lot's ability to protect the city from spies. That's what those scholars said. So then why were they being so paranoid about spies? Do you remember in chapter 14, we mentioned that there was war between Sodom and his overlord, the Elamites, right? The four kings versus five kings. And Sodom was conquered. Lot and the citizens were captured. Remember the story? Perhaps over here, they're afraid to have another war. They're afraid to have spies to come in and spy on them. Another question then, why interrogation is so bad? Why lots of interrogation is wicked? Well, because interrogation in the ancient world were typically not gentle, cruel, they use force. And then Lot told them not to be so wicked. And then what else did he say? And this sentence always puzzles me. He said, I have two daughters who have not known any men. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. How should we interpret this? But if we are following the alternative interpretation that I had just mentioned, the word no meaning interrogation instead of sexual intercourse, if, if we follow this trend of thought, Lot was probably saying, I would as soon have you violate my family members than to those whom I have taken in and offer hospitality. It would be sort of like someone saying sarcastically, to a mortgage company. Why don't you just take the clothes off my children's back and the food off their plates? Such a comment is not suggesting that they will really do that. If this is the correct reading, Lot's offering of his daughters was intended to prick the conscience of the mob, hoping that if they don't consider to treat a citizen's daughter in this inhumane way, so they shouldn't treat Lot's guests that way either. But then what did they say to Lot? They said, go away, you're just a visitor. You don't belong here. Don't be our judge. At that point, the angels intervened and dazzled their vision, so they couldn't find the door. Let's read on verse 12. Then the man said to Lot, Have you any one else here? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city. Bring them out of the place, 
for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, "Up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city." But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. The angel told Lot why they were there. We will destroy this place because God had heard the cries of suffering from these cities, and the Lord has sent us here to destroy it. The stranger whom Lot had been protecting from the mob now promised to protect him and to save also all the members of his family to flee from this wicked city. Well, the mob. Had tired themselves out at this point, and they left. So Lot went out to warn his children. He repeated the words of the angel. He said, "Get out! Get off here! Get out of this place! Because God will destroy the city." But they didn't believe him. They thought he was just a superstitious old man and fearful of his God. His daughters were influenced by their husbands, and they were very comfortable where they were. They couldn't perceive any danger. Everything was just as it had been. They were wealthy, and they could not believe that it was possible that the beautiful Sodom and their home would be destroyed. Let's read on, verse fifteen. As morning dawned, the angel urged Lot, saying, "Up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city." But he lingered, so the men seized him and his wife and his two daughters by the hand, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. So when the morning came, Lot was still dawdling, so the angel just held his hand, also his wife and his two daughters, and the two angels brought them outside the city, and so the family was saved as a unit. Here the angels left them, and turned back to Sodom to finish their work. And so it was true that, in all the cities of the plain, even ten righteous persons, they couldn't find. And God answered Abraham's prayer; He saved the one man who feared God. And so Lot was snatched from destruction. Let's read on. Verse seventeen. And as they brought them out, one said, "Escape for your life! Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills, lest you be swept away." And Lot said to them, "Oh no, my lords! Behold, your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have shown me great kindness in saving my life. But I cannot escape to the hills." Lest a disaster overtake me and I die, behold, this city is near enough to flee so, to and it's a little one. Let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my life will be saved. He said to them, Behold, I grant you this favor also, that I will not overthrow the city of which you have spoken. Escape there quickly, for I can do nothing until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and He overthrew those cities, and all the valley, and all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked behind, and she became a pillar of salt. The angels commanded him, "Escape for your life! Don't look back, and don't stay in the plain. Escape to the mountain, or else you'll be consumed." But she says that don't hesitate, don't delay, don't even cast a longing eye to your beautiful home, because that would cost your life. Don't look back. The angels' command is not really about. Not looking at the destruction as Sodom, 
After all, the people standing on the walls of Zoa, that little city, could probably watch the carnage taking place. We should notice that when the angel gave the instruction not to look back, it was placed between two other commands. It seems like these three commands is in a sequence. Number one, get out of here. Number two, don't turn back. Number three, don't stop before reaching your destination. So the verb look must therefore denote putting your attention ahead. Don't return to Sodom. How about the phrase rain down burning sulfur? The scene is one of divine retribution and brimstone appears here also in elsewhere as an agent of purification and divine wrath on the wicked. You can check it out in Psalms 11, verse 6, Ezekiel 38, verse 22. One can only speculate about the actual manner of this destruction. Perhaps there was combustion of natural tars. Remember I said the deaths, around the Dead Sea, there's a lot of tars, right? So maybe there was combustion of natural tar and sulfur deposit and the release of noxious gases during an earthquake form part of the story. You can check in Deuteronomy 29, 23 as well. So the mineral salts of the region include sodium, potash, magnesium, calcium, chloride, and bromine. An earthquake in the area could easily have ignited these chemicals, causing them to rain down on the victims of the destruction. Let me quote to you what uh, Brian G. Wood said. Brian G. Wood um, is a biblical archaeologist. This is what he said. A possible explanation for the destruction of the cities of the plain is that pressure from the earthquake caused underground flammable petroleum products to be forced up through fault lines. They then become ignited and rain down on the surrounding countryside. How about Lot's wife became a pillar of salt? This need not be interpreted as an instantaneous transformation of Lot's wife. The destruction is described in terms of God rained down sulfur and fire on the cities. And since the destruction did not begin until Lot and his daughter reached Zohar, we should assume that Lot's wife did not simply glance back but she actually returned back to the city and was swept up in the destruction like everyone else in the cities. Probably there were many pillars of salt littering on the street. Start verse 27. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. So early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord the day before, two days before. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. You know, the previous evening, as the fate of these cities hung in the balance, the conversation between Abraham and God had begun a plea from the heart 
of the future patriarch. Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? But this morning, the time for intercession is past, and evidence of destruction rises in the air before him. Thick smoke, like smoke from a furnace, fills the distant sky over the plains. And in this moment, Abraham knows with a sorrowful certainty, not even ten people could be found in the surrounding plains who worshipped the Lord God. So, in summary, what can we see in regard to God's character here? The story of Sodom and Gomorrah continues to reach through time as a warning to mankind. God is full of love and compassion, but he is also holy and just. The creator and sustainer of all things cannot have anything to do with sin and ungodliness, and rebellion against the Most High will not be allowed to continue infinitely. Did God give opportunities of repentance for the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes. According to the book Patriots and Prophets, God allowed the rays of lights to shine for a time to the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, when Abraham rescued the captives from the Elamites, the kings, his bravery, his magnanimous and noble action. Remember, he fought off the enemies, saved the captives, but he did not take any spoil. All this action drew attention to God, the God that Abraham worshipped. The people in Sodom and Gomorrah could contrast Abraham's unselfish spirit versus their own self-centered way of life. No one could deny that Abraham's religion was superior and Abraham's God was the true God. They had the opportunity to seek the God of Abraham. But sadly, they rejected the light because they loved their self-indulged way of life. So why God had to destroy the city? That's an extreme measure, isn't it? We've read in the Bible that God is a God of love and compassion. So why did he want to destroy everyone except Lot and his family in the city? Have you heard of the term, justice needs to be served? I read a case about a celebrity using his fame and popularity to assault women, assault them sexually. And ultimately, he was brought to court to face trial. But after the trial, the jury couldn't reach an unanimous verdict. And the trial declared a mistrial, and he was free. Many women, especially the victims whom had cried out for justice, were ignored. In another word, justice was not served. They felt as if the legal system was calling them liars and denying them the truth. In Genesis chapter 18 said, the Lord heard the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah. He checked out the situation and he served the cities with justice. Number two question. What can we see in regard to human nature here? Without God, man's nature is affected by sin. Every part of a person has been corrupted. The heart, the mind, the will, the affections, the desires, critical thinkings, everything. So, does this narrative teach us something of how we should live this life? Prayer matters. We see that the mercy shown to Lot had a direct link to the prayers of Abraham. 
the prayers and petitions of Abraham mattered. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham. He brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. Remember James 5, 16? The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah also reminds us of the ultimate cost of rebellion against God. God sent his own son to bridge the gap between his holiness and our depravity. On the cross, Jesus took the weight of all sin, yours and mine, so we could be reconciled to God. Three days after his crucifixion, he rose from the grave and defeated sin and death once for all. Each of us falls short of God's glory, but God made a way by sacrificing his son, Jesus, to be the propitiation or atonement for our sin. The continued rejection of Christ leads to death and destruction. As we stand beside Abraham and look out over the ruins of Sodom and Gomorrah, we must approach this ancient scene of desolation in humility and in gratitude for the redemption offered by Jesus' sacrifice. A holy God demanded justice, payment for sin, and Jesus, the precious Lamb of God, was the perfect fulfillment of this requirement. May we turn from the pride and selfishness that leads to destruction and reach out for God's life-giving offer of salvation. Then, in fullness of joy, may we invest our lives in the great adventure of loving Jesus and in sharing his love and hope with the world. Happy Sabbath.